welcome today. Uh, I'm, I'm privileged I get to be here with you guys. My name is Ryan. I'm the Brandon Campus Pastor. And so if you're new to church, um, we have another campus that meets every Sunday about 30 minutes towards Tampa that you, usually the speaker says, hey, greet everybody on the, on the camera. And we're at the receiving end of your cheers. And so we appreciate it. We, we love to know that you're there for us. And so every once in a while, I get to leave that area and come and be with you. And today is a fun day because we are, are on our second part of this series about marriage. And if you were not here last week, my challenge to you is to grab the podcast, go online, watch it because it will change your life. Uh, before we jump into that, I got one quick little just pastoral announcement for you. Here at Access, we're always trying to help you take your next steps. Wherever that is, whether that's in baptism or growth track, as Greg was talking about, or getting to a group. Uh, but one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is we've really tried to raise our standard of global impact. And one of the things is we're starting to take yearly, annually mission trips. And we have a mission trip coming up the month of June, uh, June 3rd to the 6th. And we have some spots that just came available. And so we're giving uh, the announcement to both campuses today. If you're interested in going with us to Chiapas, Mexico, which is the furthest part south of Mexico you can get, we're going to be building some homes for some widows and doing kid services at night. And we want to open it up. So if you're interested on that, on your connection card, just write Mexico and myself or somebody from the church in the next day or two. We'll get in touch with you and give you all the details. It's $1,200 for the whole trip, June 3rd through the 9th. It's going to be awesome. If you've never been on a mission trip, it'll change your life forever. I promise you, you'll never be the same with that. Now, if you were here last week, uh, we had a fun week. Pastor Jason and Liz kind of uh, had a different approach. Instead of sermonizing you guys as we do every week, instead of dropping bombs of theology, we decided this. we're in a season that... Um, we need to kind of bring some practical application to our lives. I, I don't know what the deal is, but the past maybe two months, there's been um, a rise on marriages under attack. And it's easy to say the enemy's attacking us, which he does. But there's also some things that we as a husband or a wife should analyze and bring into our lives and marriage and say, are we a part of the problem? Because kind of the enemy sometimes steps back and says, I don't really need to do much because they're handling it all by themselves, right? And so uh, marriages have this target on their back, like on the back of the couple, and that's by design. If you look into the New Testament, uh, many of the writers have this imagery where they, they, they uh, kind of compare marriage and God, and they call us the bride of Christ. They call us the bridegroom. And so there's this connection through the scriptures that we represent God in such a way that only in the office or the context of marriage can do. So why wouldn't the enemy want to destroy that? Not only for you, husband or wife, but for the people that are watching this institution as it represents Christ to nullify um, or, or, or cancel out the, the message of the cross, of redemption that you see in marriages, husbands and wife. So today we're going to jump into, uh, we're going to have some fun, we're going to have some practical stuff. We're going we're gonna to say some things that maybe will be a little offensive, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. So let's pray first. Let's ask God to be a part of this, and it's going to be fun. So Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we can gather together, and as the church, we have a responsibility to address issues that the world is certainly teaching us the wrong way. And so God, our prayer today is that you would not only give us practical things, that you would give us things to work on. But God, like big picture, we pray supernaturally. God, we pray for our marriages. We pray for the marriages that are here. We pray for the people that are going to watch this this week or next week. God, we pray that supernaturally you would do a miracle. You would do something that maybe we can't. That you would erase, eradicate the past and the failures. And from this day forward... We would say it's a Christ-centered marriage, and you've worked a miracle, and we're not perfect, but we're going to work on this as best as we can. We give you these next few moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you grew up in church, uh, at some point in your, in, your, in your life, maybe you've been a part of a youth minister, you went to youth camps, or you've been on, on retreats, and if you've been a part of church, you know that, that as you grow up, some churches do weird things, right? Like, just weird things. There are certain weird things that people do at camps and retreats, and uh, you know, maybe you've been to where uh, they, a church has called you down to, like, 
burn all of your secular CDs so that a few years later you just go back and buy them all over again. Maybe you've been at these dating messages in college ministries or high school ministries and they, they ask you to do weird things. And I can remember back when I was uh, somewhere around 14 or 15, we did these purity cards, right? It's like the pastor gets up and he tells you, you know, sex is bad, and everything about it, you shouldn't go. And then they, they march you all down to the front, and there's people everywhere, and you're signing these purity cards, right? You're going to keep yourself till marriage. You're not even going to look at a girl until then. You know, you're not even going to look at a guy. You're going to stay focused. And I remember I was standing at the edge of the stage, and, and on this purity card on the back, it said, like, pros and cons. And they, they, they had this moment where they wanted to, to have us dream about the kind of person we wanted to marry. And so... I'm like taking this super serious. I'm like writing down color of hair and the personality and what they do and the interests and, you know, the things that you don't want. Like, you know, you write those things down. And, and I'm looking and I'm like, God, you know, listen. And I look over and, and my friend simply has the word real big on it. This tells you where my friend's at. He just simply has the word sex on his card. That's it. That's all he wrote on this card. There's no pros or cons. That's what he was dreaming about that moment. And if you grew up in church at all and you kind of can, can uh, understand, like, the theology of, like, the rapture and coming back, you, you hear these messages of, like, God, I just want to be married. I just want to have sex before I get, before you come back, God. Let me just get to that place. And... We are ingrained in our lives to think about, like, our marriages in the future. And maybe it's been, like, a little distorted, like, the perception of, of relationships and intimacy has been distorted. So my question to you as we begin this t- today is, are you still dreaming about your marriage? Like, are you still having those moments, even if they're a little weird, where you can sit down and you can dream about where your m- marriage uh, is going where it should go. Maybe you're single and you're still trying to figure out the kind of person you want to complement your life and you're still asking God to bring in and you have this amazing opportunity today to dream about, uh, to define what that person may, may look like, you know, feel like, be like. And maybe you're here and you've been married for many years and the dreaming has just it's dried up. It's just stopped. Like there's no building anymore. You're not building on principles uh, anymore. And so today we're going to have a conversation. And if you're here last week, Pastor Jason and Liz kind of came with some fun stuff. And they talked about these three uh, marriage killers. And they talked about uh, fighting fair and establishing boundaries. And it was very powerful, very powerful stuff. And so today I'm going to invite my way better half, Julie, to come out and kind of talk with a few points today uh, about marriage builders today instead of marriage killers. So would you give a hand clap as my wife comes out? Would you give her a huge hand clap? Welcome, Julie, to the stage. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you. Thanks for letting me be here. So today we're going to kind of go through three marriage builders today. Practical principles that you can easily apply to your life, your marriage, whether you're, whether you're want to be married, about to be married, you've been married for 20, 30 years, you can build on these timeless principles that really at the surface level may seem basic, but when you get down to it, for some of us, it's honestly the hardest part about it. It's the hardest things that we do in marriage. Yeah, and, and just to begin, before we get started on the things that we've put together, if I'm just honest with you, I feel a little unqualified, you know, to sit here and talk to you. We're 14 years in and we're Super proud of that. 14 years is a great accomplishment. But there's some people here that um, have a lot more life experience and uh, experience in their marriages and probably could sit here and tell us a thing or two. But um, it's really humbling to be here and to be able to share what we've walked through. And so, you know, we sat down this week and we put together in as much as we could tell you that could probably... um, take a week to go through this at a marriage seminar, we put down and and formulated the three things that we feel build our marriage that have made us strong, things that we've walked through, and that we think to be able to share with you in the next 20, 30 minutes um, are things that will strengthen your marriage and build them. So we can go ahead and get started. And uh, the first thing that we want to share with you that we think is is a top priority to build your marriage is to always seek God. And as we talked about that, and we were, you know, I was, you know, brainstorming and trying to think through what, what does this mean? Does this mean our, our devotion to God, our time with him? And yes, those things are important, but I think that it has been so ingrained in us from the beginning, from maybe praying parents, maybe not, but we're always told to look for the one, right? Like that perfect person that just fits the molds, that 
complements every area in us that isn't necessarily a complimented area or just makes us perfect or is great looking or maybe you had that middle school list that check off of exactly the attributes that you wanted in another person. And the problem with that is is that we do have it, in my opinion, completely messed up because the truth is is that God is your one and your spouse is your two. So we don't often hear someone coming up and be like, mom, I met the two, you know, I met the the number two. That just kind of seems to have it backwards. But what I mean with this is that our foundation, you know, there, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, There is going to be a time, if you haven't experienced it yet, you could maybe look back and see it, where there's going to be hard times in your marriage. There are going to be times when you're just really not happy or things aren't going great. And when we make the mistake of not prioritizing, and what I mean with seeking God is is putting in place priority of where God belongs at the very foundation of our relationship. So what happens when things get hard? What happens when you're not feeling it? What happens when you hit trials, you add children to your family, something else happens when you don't have God in the spot that he wants to be which if you read the, the scriptures before, in Matthew 6, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to him, to, to you. So God recognizes that these are desires and things that you want, but if he's not in that number one spot, you have nothing to fall back on. And so many couples are trying to do it on their own, and they have no foundation in their walk with God, and I think that that's a really, really, really dangerous place. So the idea behind that of having God as one, and then he adds on to you to make your spouse number two. Yeah, I love that. Uh, in, in Matthew, Jesus, when he was presented with the question, what's the greatest commandment, he didn't say love your spouse. Uh, he said love your God uh, first. He said right here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul first, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And what happens many times we see is as marriages progress and as things go on, um, we find that many times we look at our spouse as the ultimate person that will fulfill our needs, almost like a Messiah complex, to where that is the person that will, will, will give us everything we need. And then I'm just going to let you know now, especially ladies out there, the guy will disappoint you. He will fail. Like, it's inevitable. Uh, I'll give him 24 hours into the honeymoon. He's going to do something that you're going to be like, why'd you do that? You know, it will happen. And so the, it, this point is so important that it sounds so basic. Yeah, keep, seek God first. Of course, yeah. Okay, what else you got there? But when this is not in line, everything else will domino out. When this is not the basic foundation that you exist because you serve God on your own, you see, you see God on your own, your relationship with God stands by itself, this, this will never happen like God designed. It, it will never fulfill your needs because this is the way that happens. And so, you know, we, we, we put these people up on pedestals and we, and we try, to, uh, try to look to them and when failure comes, uh, it's devastating. And maybe you're here and your marriage has kind of been rocky. And my question to you is, where is God in all of this? Like, what is his priority? Because he wants, he wants you. He, he wants you as a child. He wants your heart, the intimacy that you have before this intimacy will ever work. And it's the basic principle that you build a marriage and then a family on and kids. And the kids are watching and they see this. And it's the, that basic principle. And so, see God, we could have come up here and said, well, I think we, you need to pray. Praying is seeking God, and, you know, and we're even working on that. It's part of it. And let's see, worshiping together, that's seeking God, and that's good. And being in a group, which you should be in a group, that's good. But the bottom line is none of that even matters until you make a decision in your heart that the first priority, your heart belongs to your Father, to your, to your, to your, to your Savior, Right? to the person you have. And let me put it like this. Um, Before you can share a life, you have to have a life. Like before you can share intimacy with a significant other, you have to have a life established, uh, founded in in, in God. And it will, will, that's the only ingredients that will work. That's the only way that it'll work. I agree. Yes, and it's all about, you know, you may have mentioned this, but, but, having them as an idol, and, and that is not the heart of God. You know, he has said, no, no other gods before me. And so it's, I mean, if I'm honest, it's easy to make a priority my spouse or my children. It kind of just is easy because it's there and we're in relationship. But 
I, I can't, I mean, Ryan, I can tell you how many couples we've spoken to that this is where the problem lies, is that they have no foundation. They have nothing keeping them sturdy. So they're, they're dependent on one another so much that that's when, they, when that one is not there to fall back on, things fall apart. So God, his desire and his way for creating us was for worship and for relationship with him. So, you know, look into that, really dive into what that means in pursuing. And then this leads us to my favorite part because I, I think we've kind of got this one down, but making fun a priority. I, I know that sounds so simple, but my goodness, Ryan and I have a lot of fun. Wouldn't you say we have a lot of fun together? And um, if you're not making time in your marriage for fun, the honest truth is that one day you may look back and not have a marriage because those kids are going to be gone one day if you don't have kids yet in your marriage. They are going to grow up and be gone, and we better like each other, and I, I think we've got that. But then we're going to narrow down this section into three um, mini sections. You know, what does this mean? How do you make such an elementary principle um, speak truth? And so the first area um, to make your relationship fun is face-to-face -face time. And I, this is one of my pet peeves and an area that we all struggle with, but we have lost the art of time with each other face-to-face, -face, haven't we? What's come in our lives? We are, we, we are um, overwhelmed and we are um, inundated with a false sense of being face-to-face. -face. We've got our cell phones. We, we, we show this, um, this false sense of reality of who we are. Uh, I'm in nursing school right now. So everybody can give Ryan a hug after this because he is literally taking care of everything at home while I am a slave to the books. I'm almost done. I graduate in April. Super excited about that. But I will be at my bedroom has, unfortunately, do not take this and don't write this into your notes because you should never make your bedroom um, your study center. But I've made all the mistakes because of limited space in our home because there's four kids and they're everywhere. So I need a place that I can close the door that's not the kid's bedroom or the laundry room or the garage. So he's given us our bedroom. Isn't that sad? He still sleeps in there sometimes. But um, so my desk is set up there, and I am, I'm constantly on my computer. I am constantly working. It's pretty miraculous that I'm even able to think straight today, so thank you for that. But um, I can text from my computer, and I'm always on my computer, and my texts pop up. And so it'll be like, hey, Ryan, could you make sure that the Jack's lunch was made for tomorrow morning, right? And I hear him shouting from the other, why don't you just come in here and tell me what you need? I mean, so I'm just trying to illustrate the point of this. I mean, he wants to see my face. Thank you for wanting to see my face. But that's just an important part of it. You know, um, it, it's, it's just lost. I feel like, and, and this is a rule that we've kind of made with our children. Some of them have iPods. Some of them have it. But when we go out, when we leave the home, I don't care who we're with and who else is doing it. Put it down. You are missing time with friends. You are, you are looking at the world. You're looking at relationships through a very narrow lens and a very narrow focus, and you are missing so much of things. And they'll say, you know, we'll go to Disney, but I want to get the fireworks on film. I say, put it in your mind and remember that, and don't miss out on the opportunity. And, and it's speaking to me. But Ryan and I, when we go out, we, we try to make it a priority um, to put down our phones, except if the babysitter's calling to, to get our attention for the kids. You know, that, that, that I do understand. But to put it down and to make time for one another. And it's easy to make excuses, especially when you become a parent. I mean, I remember when mine were really little, and it was expense, or it was, I feel guilty getting away from the kids. But let me tell you, those little lives are looking at you right now. And wouldn't it be more beneficial for you to set the example of you wanting to have that connection? I mean, the, hopefully the very reason that they exist is because of your love um, with your partner. And for them to, to, to establish those boundaries now and to establish those foundations, for them to be able to see that you love to spend time together, these are the things that they're going to bring into their relationship. So quit making excuses. If you don't have money, there are great groups here, right? We have a lot of access groups, and I'm sure a lot of friends that will babysit your kids for you. Call me. I probably won't do it, but, um, <laughs> but I might. I'll think about it. I'll send somebody out there. But it's so important that you, that you spend time together, that you're face-to-face, -face, that you don't lose what you first had and what you first loved, because when it's gone, what's left? Yeah, the, intim the intimacy of face-to-face -face is so important. In fact, as a pastor, like the three things that we usually see where marriages fail are communications, finances, or sex. Those are the, it's the three. It's the trinity of what we see when marriages fall apart. And the Song of Solomon, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to um, uh, Song of Solomon 
chapter 7. And if you know about Song of Solomon, it is provocative. It is like, wow, are you allowed to say that in the scriptures? It's steamy. It is, it's fun. And so we're going to jump into Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 7. And this is what he says to his bride, to the Shulamite woman. He says, how beautiful your sandaled feet so he starts from the bottom. He's face to face with his, with his woman, his lady friend. And he starts from the bottom and he moves all the way up her body. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O oh, princess daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels. The work of an artist's hands. He's just laying it out. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. I'm not sure what that means, but that's okay. Your waist is a mound of wheat. Like he's just, wouldn't you love to hear this lady? You ladies, your waist is a mound of wheat encircled with lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns. <laughs> like twin <laughs> fawns <laughs> of a gazelle. He's, he's excited about this. He's writing his, he's putting his heart out on these, on these pages. Your neck is like an ivory tower. There's a good one. Take that one. That'll, that'll, your eyes are the pool of Heshbon by the, ba- by the gate of Bath Rabim. He is going through and he's sharing details. Guys, listen. Share details. Men, say details. Detail. Say details again. Our our wives want to hear details. That means you need to, I don't care what you have to do, you need to remember the day that your wife gets a haircut so you can compliment her. If she's wearing a new outfit, compliment her. Talk about the details of her. Compliment the details of her. If you've not had an example of your past to share things, to, to verbally communicate your approval towards your wife, then you need to start doing this today. Guys, share details. Women love to hear details. Women love to know that they have a husband that sees the little things about their life that are, that are they see the important little things. That if, there's a, that if there's a test coming or a work project coming or if they've just had one of those days and you know that they're just like, they're done. Like they're like, I'm not going to be a mom anymore. The kids are driving me crazy. Listen to the details. Listen and hear the details so you can step in and you could be what your wife needs. That's that face-to-face Uh, communication. Solomon's amazing. He just laid it out for us. I don't know why you don't write me like that, but (laughs) um, yeah, details are, and we like to share them too. And so listen to those details. Poor Ryan. I've been in the hospitals and if anybody has any experience in healthcare, he gets, he gets uh, minute by minute details and he has been so gracious to (laughs) not get disgusted or leave me by that. But okay, so the second part of making fun a priority Um, Here's our another simple thing is side by side, and this is where we go and we do things together. Some of my absolute favorite memories are experiencing brand new things with my husband. Our honeymoon, we went to California, and it was awesome. We got to see the redwoods, and we got to see the waterfalls, and uh, didn't we go to the jail in the prison in San Francisco? We did that too. That was awesome. But doing things together, spending time together is such a valuable part of your marriage is, is going and doing things. And, you know, it's not always... Um, just doing things that we both love. We do, you know, we've been together for 17 years, so we've got a lot of similarities that have evolved and interests and things. But sometimes it's about stepping out and doing something that I don't like. You know, sitting down and watching sports on a Sunday. Maybe not every Sunday, you know, that gets to be a lot. And we have a lot of responsibilities. But me saying, and this goes into what Liz and Jason were talking about last week, is expectations saying, you owe me. And love saying you before me. So going, Ryan is great about that. He listens to the things that he knows I may have mentioned. And then he tries to act on those things. And it's constantly looking for ways to improve our marriage. He's a lot better at me, better with this than I am. But, you know, putting ourselves out there. I led a, um, a ladies group over the summer. And we were talking about many things. But speaking about our relationships, and I said, let's this week, and maybe this will be homework for you all, let's do something that you know, and it might even be something that annoys you, but something that he loves. Why? Because you're in this for the better of them than the better of me. And so, you know, going along with that, experiencing life together, holding hands. We do like it when you come with us to go shopping. You don't like it because we spend all of your money, but we have a really good time knowing that you're there and we want to know what you think about what we're picking out. You know, everything that we do, hopefully, um, you know, in, in, a, in a solid relationship is for each other, is to better us. Face to face, side to side, and the third one which I chose to take is 
skin to skin. Obviously, you know why I gave him that one. <laughs> Sexual intimacy is so important. God created it. It is an act of worship, the scripture says. And so, Song of Solomon, let's jump back in. I mean, this is the, this is the word of God. It says in Song of Solomon, <laughs> verse 11, Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. That's the adventure part. That's the side by side. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early in the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if the blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Translated, if we go out, if you take me out, we will potentially have sex uh, anywhere you would like, in a vineyard if you would like. Now, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that's the modern translation. If you want to go to jail, I'm sure you can, yep, go for it. <laughs> Sexual intimacy was created for God, by God in the context of a God-centered marriage. And when that uh, get sidetracked. When, when, when we give that away some, in some other context, it is devastating. It will devastate not only you, but it will devastate your spouse. And honestly, you, do, you know this. This is, this is probably the number one reason that we find affairs that happen is because somewhere in, in, in the path, the sexual needs uh, were not fulfilled. And, and this is on both sides, guys and and, and women have this ability to get this wrong. Guys are visual. Guys feel like they need it just about every day. Guys put those expectations on uh, their spouse, and failure can happen. And so when a guy feels like it's not being met, which is, is most likely their unrealistic expectations based off previous relationships or what they've viewed online, if I'm just honest, and so you get these images, you, you, you impose that into your, into your marriage, and things start to get so messy and start to get so messed up. Like, uh, you know, guys, like, we have this ability to work on this, to, like, uh, to, to really work on this, to, to set an atmosphere for that with your wife, to prefer your wife, to, I mean, guys, let's, like, like uh, put on some music, take a shower once in a while, uh, and set, set it a romantic night out, you, you know, make dinner, take care of the kids, put them down, massage the feet, put on some Marvin Gaye, just do, set an atmosphere so that there is this lead up, this romance to it, instead of just wanting to be like, hey, hey the kids are down, let's go. Like romance, and then women, maybe just have a plan. Maybe just come up with something, like step out and, and get a plan. Like, you know, guys will turn anything into, into sex. They will. Like you're going to, you know, she, she may say, hey, the, the oil light is on in the van. You need to change the oil. I'll say, I'll change your oil. You know, everything can be turned into something sexual, everything. right? Uh, hey, uh, okay, hey, honey, I'm, I'm stunning. Can you make me a sandwich? Oh, I'll make you a sandwich, all right. <laughs> I come home from the hospital with God knows what on my scrubs, and I'm going, how can you possibly think I'm attractive right now? It's like there's nothing I can do, but look, I really want to drive this point home. I almost feel like I should stand up, but ladies, this is serious, okay? And, and this is where you can kind of see where things evolve. Um, we are the only, the only God-approved outlet for our husbands. Everything outside of that is sin. You've got to take that seriously. And, 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 and we dismiss that. Listen, I get it. I, I understand what it feels like to give all day in a physical sense as far as with your children. Maybe you're a nursing mother. Maybe you've been puked on, spit on. I don't know what has happened throughout your day. You've been to the gym, you're sweaty. I don't know. But when you look at this through the eyes of if I am not in unity with my husband in this skin-to-skin -skin, um, realm, now listen to me, I am not condoning affairs, I don't. And if you have any problem with anything I say, you can uh, email Liz at access.tv. <laughs> anything that I say that you don't agree with, that's fine, Jason too. But um, the point that I'm making with that is that when we close this area off and we're not in unity, we're not um, preferring you before me, it's, it would be as, as the same weight as if our husbands, which some may, have closed themselves off to, to, to listening to the needs that we have, for us expressing the things that we've been to. We need that. That's an outlet for us. When we don't get that, 
we find it elsewhere. I am not saying that it's okay to have an affair. I am not saying that. But can you see how it evolves? Because let me tell you, if this area is weak, the temptation will come where someone will listen to the needs that you have. And it, and it beca- I mean, a husband doesn't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to step out on my wife. Things, and, and, and same with a wife stepping out on her husband. Things have happened. Communication has stopped. Physical contact is less than it was. When we first got married, we had this challenge. I, 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 we didn't come up with it. But it was to fill a jar with every single time you had sex in the first year of marriage, and it's supposed to be like overflowing, and then you take out a dollar the second year or whatever you had put in, but I don't know. I think we were short on money one of the months, and we just ordered pizza on the rest of that money, but, you know, just the idea. Things are going to change. Priorities. Things are going to change in your marriage. I mean, he looks a lot like he did when he was 18 years old, but some things have changed. You know, it's not going to be the same. (laughs) It's not the same. Things are going to change. And when we look at it, you know, why we got into this in the first place, it's so much deeper um, than the initial reasonings before this. Yeah, exactly. Have fun. And fun is face-to-face. It's an adventure. It's it's sex. Sex should be fun in your marriage. Like, reevaluate some things in this area. And this is like so, like this is 1% of this whole subject. But let me bring it to an end here because the third point is, is maybe one of the, maybe the most powerful one is it's simply this. Um, never give up. Man, I, I can't tell you how many marriages that I've, I've been in, in, in a counseling session with or I hear that they just simply, they just gave up. They just, they, they got out of the fight. They stopped fighting for this covenant. And it's not a contract. A contract limits responsibility. A contract binds you to what's on that paper. But as soon as somebody falls out of what's on that paper, uh, you, you, you lose the rights that you have. A contract is permanent. It's like taking up two pieces of paper, super gluing them together. And when things get messy on both sides, when you try to rip them apart, they just rip and they break and they tear. Never give up. One of the statements that we decided at a young age um, to make sure that we had in priority is is just the idea that we're going to start this marriage with the end in mind, with the very end in mind. And on one of our dates, we we took many dates. We spent a lot of times just like you guys, where you like you're in love, you think, and so you're talking about your dreams and everything that you have, and you've got that spark in your eye, and it doesn't matter what's going on, and you can be anywhere, and you can be talking, and it's like magical. It's like what, what would annoy you uh, when it's raining because your hair is getting messed up. In those conversations, you're like, bring it on because this is magical. This is, this is like, you know, movie kind of stuff here. And one of the times, uh, we went on a date to one of those pottery places that you just do, you know, you paint something, and um, I have it with me because we've had it for this long. It was, uh, Julie made this for me on April 13th, 2001, and she simply wrote this statement. Now, if you, uh, if you, I'm 40 years old, I turned 40 this year, and a couple decades ago, if you were around and you liked movies, you probably saw the Adam Sandler movie, The Wedding Singer, right? It's it's a fun song, and so she simply wrote on here, I want to grow old with you. And this is more than just like a fun statement. This is, this is a goal. This is a declaration of I am going to start this relationship with the end in mind, that we're going to grow old together. And it's not going to be easy. And if you're just honest, maybe you're in this room and you've thrown out the D word because you're ready to give up. You're ready to call it quits. It's simply this moment where you have a decision to make to to run face first into the hands of God and work out all the mess and it's gonna take time or you can give up. I'll say it like this. You can give up like what the world would do, but we have a responsibility to protect the institution of marriage. We have a responsibility to work through our problems. This sounds so much easier, you know, saying this. But you have family that's around, you have friends that are, you have pastoral staff that none of us are like uh, certified counselors, but we'll help you. We'll help you take those next steps. That's why we exist here at, at Access is to help you take those steps and we'll get you on the path because from this day forward is the focus. Not what he did, not what she did, not what he didn't do. But at some point, you have to draw a line in the sand. And so to, this is a conversation we're having. And so two quick things. I'm going to have Julie pray in just one second. But this conversation does not end when she says amen. Like if you're, if you're a married couple in here, my challenge to you is take this. And, and at lunch today or if you put the kids down tonight, have some tough conversations. 
you're in this for the long haul. Like you get, you get one chance at this in God's eyes, one holy opportunity to protect the institution of marriage. And love sometimes finds its way of squeezing out of that equation and maybe you've fallen out of love and sometimes you've got to do the actions and let the emotions follow. So today, talk through these things together. Communicate, have fun, establish these things and set the course so that in the long run, when you hit 90, 100, you're still slow dancing to some Marvin Gaye in the, in the living room because God wants that for you. Can we pray? Lord, I thank you so much for this this intimate moment, Lord, in your presence, Father. And I pray that the ears that needed to hear this today, God, that they would be so opened. And Lord, I just pray that the the points that were made today, God, that we would get back to the foundation of our walk with you, God, that we would seek first your kingdom and righteousness, Lord, and that as we do that, all other things will be added, God. You will make things right. So, Father, I pray that those that aren't feeling it anymore, God, I pray that you would awaken something inside of them, Father, today. Lord, I pray that marriages would be restored for, for those that are, are tempted with the thoughts, and that's where they begin, God. Those that, that are um, inundated with thoughts of what's better somewhere else. God, I pray that as what was spoken last week, the things that we allow into our, into our homes, into our minds, God, that those things we would continually reevaluate are the things that I'm doing today, building my marriage towards the end goal. And if not, that we would have the strength to remove them, God. But I pray that um, anybody here that struggles in any of these areas that we've discussed, God, that before it becomes something that it shouldn't be, that they would know to go and speak to someone about this, Lord. So I pray that uh, relationships would blossom, that they would grow, Lord, and that you would protect this covenant of marriage that society tells us to go into it thinking maybe it will work. But God, we know that your desire is to make these couples strong and to be powerhouses for the kingdom of God. So Lord, Thank you for your word that went forth this morning, God. I pray that every ear and every heart would be open and that the conversation would continue as we uh, dismiss today. And we love you and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.